So let's start with, are we ready for a reading? Is my show ready for a reading and what that looks like? And for me to be able to go, yes, I want to do Patty's show. I want to do Lisa's show. I want to do Pam's show. Are we ready? The first thing that you have to have, the first sign of if you are ready or not, is you have to have your elevator pitch. And that needs to be a written pitch as well as a spoken pitch. If you cannot succinctly put into words what your show is, what it's about within 30 to 60 seconds, you're not ready for a reading. You might have pages and pages of music. You might have script and score. You might have all of these ideas. You might even have vision boards for costumes and sets and lighting and everything. But if you can't quickly and succinctly tell me what your show's about, whether that's a nice little perfect written thing that I can read or your elevator pitch. If we ran into each other in an elevator at a Las Vegas casino and we connected really quickly and he said, oh yeah, I write musicals. Okay, well, what are you working on right now? You should be able to tell me very quickly what you're looking for. The second thing that I think is even more important than the script and the score, which is the last one, um, is what is the what are the needs of this show? What are the cast needs? And do you have character descriptions? Um, that is the biggest thing that I need when I'm looking at if I can even make this happen or not. If you are creating the next Les Mis with 45 cast members and they all have different tracks and different solo lines and different characters and different everything, that's probably not going to be something that I'm going to be able to easily produce um, on a reading level. Um, so cast needs and then character descriptions and really making sure that you have clear expectations of what that is and what that looks like for you. Um, and I would also encourage you, and we'll talk a bit later um, when we're talking about the actor's point of view on this, um, about breaking stereotypes and leaving these characters some room to um, be open to all genders, ethnicities, sizes, vocal types, ages, everything. That really also helps in a reading as well, um, if I've got some flexibility with that. Um, it's really difficult when we're working with um, shows that are going to have um, a very specific, I mean, if you are needing um, a 78-year-old Asian American man who can tap dance and is a, you know, high, high tenor, that's going to be really difficult if that is what the role um, is. If, the, if that's what the role requires, totally let us know. This might be a little more difficult for us to do a reading of it. So as, as broad and as specific, and I know that's kind of confusing, but if you have expectations of these roles can be played by anybody, that's super helpful, or we need very specific information about what those roles look like, who needs to play them, um, and what your expectations are there. Then the last thing about, are you ready for a reading? Um, that comes down to the script and the score. At the bare minimum, for me to be able to give you a successful read through a semi-stage from beginning to end with audience, with script, with music, I need a piano vocal score. That is really the bare minimum that I need. Um, I have seen shows that have come across my desk that are fully orchestrated and that is amazing. And I wish my brain worked that way. I love it. I love seeing flutes and clarinets and trombones and French horns and all of these amazing things. But that's not something that I'm going to be able to throw together in the backyard of a house um, or even in a small space, mainly just logistically. Um, for a lot of these shows, we are doing them acoustic with no mics. Um, and there's just only so much that the average vocalist can sing over, right? Um, now, if we were working with something that was a rock band that was going to require amplification, we'd figure that out. But on the very basic, a piano vocal score is the bare minimum. That is what I need for one, for me to be able to play through, to have an understanding of what these um, voices are going to need, what the ranges are going to need, what the um, what that's going to look like. So piano vocal score is the bare minimum that I need. Um, another thing that is um, really important as well is 
chords. I, I know that that sounds so crazy, but if you can add the chord structure, the guitar chords to your piano vocal, especially if in your mind it is fully orchestrated and all of that, if you can put the chord structure on your piano vo vocal, it gives me as the pianist or my band a little bit more um, flexibility um, if everything's not fleshed out all together. Um, then, so that's the bare minimum and we'll make it work after that. If you want to be my best friend and my actor's best friend, the best, most wonderful thing that you could ever do for us is a merged script and score. And I'm gonna be posting um, some examples of this in the circle. So if you're not in the circle group, get with Holly on how to be in there um, because I'm gonna post some examples. So just imagine, and this kind of transitions into our actual reading. Um, you're an actor, you've been hired by me to learn a whole show in one week and perform it in one week. That's what we do. We usually start on a Sunday or Monday and we perform it on Sunday night. Um, I will tell you that speed is what creates magic. I have actors who are white knuckling their music stands to get through these productions and it provides such an amazing energy and excitement and freshness to these shows that I would never do it any other way. It really is amazing. But the most difficult thing is that most shows, and again, just because of how things are done in our industry, have a script and a score. And when you are doing a show that's not by memory, you're constantly having to flip back and forth between those two. Now, the majority of my actors are using iPads and there's so many amazing things that we can do with technology that allows us to jump back and forth from the script to the score. But if it is merged into one document, that makes our lives immensely easier. Um, it makes our rehearsals easier. It makes changes easier. Um, it makes underscoring easier as well. Yes, Disney offers that with their children's shows. All the junior shows are doing that and it's absolutely amazing. If you're like, Rebecca, there's absolutely no universe in which I can merge my script and score. I get it. Um, it involves technology and that's hard. A couple of things that you can do that's not a true merge that will help us. One, making sure that in the songs, so if there's a duet and there are, you know, John and Alice are singing a duet and there's an underscored section and there's dialogue put that dialogue in the score. That helps us so, 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 so much. At the very minimum, any lines that are supposed to be spoken that during a song, during number 14, if they can be in the music too, that is hugely helpful. Um, if not, if not, if not, if that's not the thing, then another simple thing that you can do for us um, is just page break your script and your score so that um, if, you know, between in, in the script that page 14 and 15, if there's a song in between that, it's a whole new page, if that makes sense, because then it's so much easier for us to um, jump back and forth. I do have actors who kill a bunch of trees to do these shows and they print, all, print it all out and they do a very fun binder with copy and paste and all of that. Um, and until I can afford to just buy a classroom set of iPads to pass out at all my readings, we'll be doing that as well. Okay, let's talk about the actual readings. So my readings are not memorized and that's mainly for the script. I encourage all of my singers to be off book on their songs. Now, the only time that we fall into any issues with this is patter songs, <laughs> um, songs that are super, super, super wordy. Um, that's a lot to ask, but for, um, and then also ensemble harmonies, things like that, we don't worry about. But for the solos, for the solos, especially if they are emotional or there's a deep connection to them and it's not just your standard setting the scene, um, I ask them to memorize the solos. One, they, I get better vocals out of them. Two, they connect with the audience so much better. And a lot of times those solos are being sung to somebody, right? They're being sung to somebody. 
So we do not memorize the script. We do not memorize the lines. Um, but I would say that the songs, especially solos, are 70 to 80% memorized. Um, and we do it all with music stands. But this is not your boring stand at a stand stoic type of performance. We use these music stands as set pieces. We use them as props. We use them as, um, I had one scene where an actor was supposed to leave the room in a, in a rush and they slammed their music stands down and went back to their chair. And let me tell you, that was more powerful than them leaving the stage and shutting a door behind them. Um, so we very much utilize these music stands. They get a lot of abuse. <laughs> um, and then we don't always come back to the same stand. Not everybody has a home stand where you're always in stand three. Um, we do a row of stands or sometimes little pods of stands. And then everybody has chairs that they go back to. And again, sometimes they don't always go back to the same chair. Um, and they will go to certain places. And that's why it's really helpful if they have an iPad or they bring their binder with them. Um, for those scenes. So it's a very active thing. I don't want you to go, oh man, there's no way that anyone's ever going to understand the depth or the connection of my musical by just um, standing with stands. It is more than that. Um, I used to say that we were never going to do props again, because let me tell you, props are a slippery slope. Once you start then you feel like everything has to be a prop and you can't have half the things having props and half the things being, you know, mimed or improvised. But we do end up having, I would say like a 30% to 40% prop situation. Um, and then also we utilize, um, depending on the show, um, somebody who reads stage directions, if appropriate. And we're not, we're talking like setting the scene stage directions. We don't do the, and Johnny walks across the stage. We don't do that. We, those little simple ones. We're talking about the ones that are setting the scenes. Um, but a lot of the things like in Bucket of Blood, which is one that we're doing, there's um, a lot of dramatic things that happen. And instead of being able to physically stage them out, um, we'll use different ways. Um, I did a show once where it was a bunch of witches and they all start flying at one point. Well, obviously we're not gonna be flying in my backyard. That's not gonna happen. So on the music stand, they actually flipped over a sign that said, I'm flying. And it was great. And it was a huge hit and it really, and it really worked well. So that's what they are going to look like um, on the performance side of it. For the most part, they're gonna be piano only. I kind of explained that before. One, that's because I play the piano. Um, but we've had some where like acoustic guitar has been a really um, important part. Um, I'm looking at for this next one that we're doing with Bucket of Blood. Um, we're probably going to have uh, woodwinds, um, a woodwind specialist who will do the clarinet and saxophone part just because um, it's very much kind of another character in the show. So if you had a show that had a very meaningful cello line and like that needed or that that cello line was quite a theme. We would do everything in our power to make sure that we utilized a cello line. Where we can't is, you know, full out percussion, um, you know, any other electronic instruments, you know, bass and guitar, trumpets, things like that. It's just impossible to sing over. Um, and, and we would just have to kind of look at those things to see what's going to be, what's going to work. Um, so that's what the stage reading will look like. The process um, for the writer involvement is really up to you, the writers. Um, I want the writers to be involved as much as they're comfortable. I definitely want them to come see the performance as pos if possible. Um, and just know that right now we're in Dallas, Fort Worth, but I can really do this anywhere. The difference comes down with in Dallas, I can do things for free. In Dallas, I have rehearsal space and performance space and actors and musicians for free. If I go other locations, things start to cost money. Um, spe again, specifically for Bucket of Blood, I could have cast this show two times over in New York for free. We totally could have done it, but we would have been looking at rehearsal space and performance space, and that's not free. Um, and so until 
the, some rich benefactor decides to sponsor me and go, yes, you can spend $5,000 a week on performance space and rehearsal space in New York. That's going to be our roadblock. The same thing if Wayne wanted me to come up to British Columbia and produce his show there, I definitely could, but I'm going to be kind of starting from scratch. He might have free rehearsal space and performance space, but I might not have the connections and the actors up there. So then we would have to be looking at either bringing actors up there or kind of starting from scratch when it comes to the talent as well. Just know that we're flexible with that. Um, and the baseline is Dallas Fort Worth just because that's where my resources are and where I can do it for free. Um, writer involvement. Um, again, because of our time constraints, the reason I can get such amazing talent to produce these shows, to sing your songs, to, to realize this in one week um, is because normally that's about all the free time. Pre-pandemic, I was able to get people because they had one week between other productions, between other shows. Um, they wouldn't be able to commit to me for a three to four week per, you know, rehearsal process. But the reason I'm able to get these cast lists of just phenomenal talent is because I'm only asking for them of one week. And that's where the writer involvement does get sticky. While I would love to have you at every rehearsal and have your feedback at every rehearsal, we just don't have the time, right? We don't have the time to have that immediate feedback. Um, but I do need writers who are going to be communicative about my questions about their show, because if you're not, I'm going to assume and I'm going to treat you like a writer that is no longer with us. And then I'm just going to make my own decisions and answer my questions the way that I see fit. But that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for writers who, when I have questions about, hey, did you really mean for this song to be sung up the octave? If you did, that's awesome. If, you know, if Mrs. Jones is going to have a little operatic soprano moment, awesome, we'll do that. But it might've just been a typo, right? So I need people who are going to um, interact with me about the simple things, about, you know, um, in their, you know, inaccuracies between the script and the score, which one do you want us to go with? But then also to be able to have conversations with me about the tougher things, um, about, you know, can we change the language of this sentence because it's unnecessarily offensive? Um, or what is your reasoning behind um, this? And we need to be able to have those conversations um, for, for us to both be happy with what that final product looks like. Um, and then the last thing that we can offer you with these readings is feedback, producer and cast feedback. Um, that is my favorite part of it. And we can do that in whatever format that you um, either A, have the time or that are comfortable with. I understand so much how difficult that part of this process is. These are your babies. These are, um, and the, they're your children. And, it's, and sometimes it's tough to take that that constructive criticism back. Um, and so, and again, that's gonna be different for everybody because it's gonna be different for every stage and then also with the involvement. But I want you to be able to get that feedback from me as somebody who's producing the show and go, okay, this is how it worked for the stage reading. But if I was doing this show in real life, fully realized, this is where my roadblocks would be. And we need to talk about that. We need to see how it's gonna look. From the cast, getting feedback for them about how they felt playing those characters, what works for them, what didn't work for them, what parts were really difficult to get into their voice, what parts of their character were really difficult to realize, or what even just dialogue just didn't feel right or didn't roll off the tongue. Those things we can give you feedback, but the best feedback that I can give you is the audience feedback. That is, that is the best feedback. Um, I will say doing these shows as intimately as we do, Right now we're outside, one, it's lovely, it's summer. Um, but when we, probably by October, I, I hope that we'll be back in homes and be back in these um, intimate locations. That is something that I just can't replicate. Being in a small space with the audience and the actors, being able to hear them laugh, hear them cry and feel them laugh and feel them cry and feel the reactions that they have to your work. That is just the best feedback that we can do. Great question, John. Um, Frank, John, are the readings recorded? Yes, they're recorded. It's going to be 
difficult for the outdoor ones to get just a super professional recording. Um, we're going to do more than just a phone recording. Um, I'll be using a Zoom Q8 just because I have plenty of them in the warehouse and it's a really high quality recording. But when you are outside, um, that is going to be the difficult thing. What my plan is for the outside ones is to also record the last run through that'll probably be inside as well. Um, for the inside ones, um, definitely will be able to provide for your recording. Um, I personally don't have, and this is not a joke, the bandwidth um, to look into the streaming options of them as well, um, just because that starts to get difficult with um, expectations of, I don't want people to be like, oh, this was supposed to be streamed and then there'd be technical difficulties. That's just not something that I have the personal bandwidth to offer. Um, but it's definitely something that if the writer wanted to make sure and that was their responsibility to have it streamed, we could definitely look at that. Is there a cast size maximum or don't you know that yet? Um, I will say that it really depends on if we're doing inside or outside. Um, most homes in DFW, we've kind of maxed out at like 12 or 14 people is what I can have in a cast. Now, We've also gotten really good about having multiple people play multiple roles, right? So if you've got, um, you know, that's something that we definitely can do because we don't have to worry about costume changes. We're not having to worry about those other logistics. Um, and so we definitely can do larger cast shows if there is a way to do it, um, maybe not so accurately, um, but you know, something where we change a hat and now we're clearly a different character or not. Okay, questions about the actual readings. Any other questions before I talk about just kind of what I feel like the world is looking for in musicals and hopefully speak to some of that and what I'm looking for. And that'll kind of lead us into our pitch night thing as well. Do you invite local producers or do some watch virtually? Yes, we do invite local producers. I will say at all of my shows, we have, I uh, have great relationships with theater owners, producers, um, and they come mainly not because of me, but because of the people who are in the show and they are like, oh, I def I want to hear so-and-so sing, or I want to hear, oh man, I can't imagine to hear these three voices. Um, so yes, a lot of them do come. And then depending on, again, where you are in your development, if that is something that you're looking for, we definitely can provide that. Um, because I think that, you know, the difficulty for musicals specifically and why it's so hard to get new musicals on existing theater seasons is that, you know, John Doe who runs the theater can read scripts all day long, right? They can read scripts. We read scripts. We can read scripts and our imaginations can kind of get going. But if you're not a pianist or a musician or there isn't a demo or there isn't recordings of all the, all the songs, it's really difficult for you just to like look at this script and this music and kind of visualize what you could do with it. Um, for all of my readings that I have had, I have had so many people go, oh my gosh, that would be so cool. In our space, we could do this. In our space, we could do this because it gives them that ability not to just see the show, but we leave so much to the imagination that it allows them to put their producer mind on it, put their creative mind on it they can envision the costumes and they can envision. We do, a, you know, normally we wear like all black, but then everybody kind of wears black in the idea, the style of their character, right? So if their character is really sloppy, baggy clothes, they're going to be really sloppy, baggy clothes. If their character's super sexy vixen, they're going to be super sexy vixen, right? We kind of try to do that and give people a little bit of an idea, but more just to help my actors get in the character, um, more than trying to inform the audience. I think another way, a good description actually that my mom said about our performances, she said, it's kind of like a radio show, but we're in person, right? Um, because that there is so much imagination that goes involved with it. It is like listening to a radio show and listening um, to all the voices um, but with just like a little bit extra, like a, a radio show plus. In selling a music goal, do you think a recording of this type of reading is enough for the potential producer to see a show's potential? I think so. I think that a, 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 a recording of watching of this would be enough for somebody to go, yep, I totally get an idea 
of what this looks like. And I think it's just really right in that perfect place where you're, you know, I'm not trying to, as producer, director, design the show as much as I am trying to just provide the material, give it life, give it ears, and give it a voice. Okay, other questions about the reading? It's not something that I'm interested in personally, just because um, just because it really makes it so confined, right? That it, that it makes it so confined, so especially for like underscoring and things like that. More often than not, that stuff doesn't line up, right? Um, because we're not walking across the stage. We're not doing costume changes. It does fall into that issue again of amplification. It's easy to sing over a piano, less easy to sing over, you know, piped in music, but it's something that we're just going to have to discuss. Again, my preference and what does it get makes it so much easier is when we can have piano vocal, um, especially for, um, you know, when we're casting this, if we want to have some flexibility with, you know, the key, like, okay, we've got this, but this singer for this production is not going to be able to sing it in F, we need to go down to D, those kind of things. Um, having some flexibility there is nice. Um, is underscoring or transitional parts usually included in a reading? Underscoring, yes transitional, not so much, right? A lot of times I find myself um, only playing the first couple of measures of any written transitional parts because we don't need it, right? We're not, there's not a scene change. There's no sets moving. It's literally just people walking from chair to stand, but underscoring, I love. I think that underscoring, if it's available, sets the scene so much, right? I mean, it really makes a difference. I think it makes, you know, emotional mo moments more emotional, um, and then we kind of, you know, and we, depending on the song, there's times that, you know, yeah, we're going to go ahead and let, even if we don't have a walk across the stage or we don't have a scene change, we're going to let that musical moment play out. Even if it means that they're standing at their stands because it's so meaningful, or maybe it's the revisiting a theme from earlier that is so meaningful and so powerful. Um, but so a lot of times though, realistically, if there is underscoring or transition music or playoff music, a lot of times I'm just playing a couple measures of it. Um, oh, good question. What about the length of the show? Full length would 60 minutes be too short, too long? Should there be an intermission for a full length in this reading? Um, I don't care if your show is four hours long. If it's interesting and captivating, I'm gonna do it, right? Um, so my preference is nothing longer than like, an hour 15 without an intermission. And that's just because I have a small bladder and normally I'm ready to go. And I know that that is how, and that's why I don't go see movies. You're probably going Rebecca, TMI. But it's, it's literally the reason that I don't go to movie theaters is because I hate missing stuff. Um, so I love short musicals. I think that there's a place for short musicals. Um, and honestly, we could even do two in one night. If there was two 60 minute shows, we could totally even do that. Um, I also think that, you know, an hour 15, hour 30, if interesting and captivating and keeping interest by itself is really good. Um, I will say though, that a lot of producers really like intermissions because they make a lot of money at intermission. Um, and so if there is a good, and I think that intermissions can be used as, as a part of the story. I mean, cliffhanger. I mean, that's why we watch television and go and watch, you know, now it's a little hard with Netflix because we're binging everything, but you know, those, those episode cliffhangers are like, oh, I can't wait until next, you know, until next week, we can utilize that in musicals as well. And that's, what's so fun about intermission. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about what I'm personally looking for, um, when it comes to like the, the what I'm going to gravitate towards. And this comes into play with our pitch night. I am so blessed to have an online community between a couple of different groups. One, I have an audition prep for Rebecca Lowry group that I have on Facebook that's got a thousand members in it um, that, I, that I communicate with them all the time. And then I also do this 21 day challenge where I get to work with actors, producers, audience members. And this year has really provided for us all really some, some time. We've had the gift of time that we've never had before to really have these conversations of like, what are we looking for? What do we, where do we want to spend our time and energy? And like I said, at the top, I really want to spend my time and energy on new works. I'm interested in 
small cast shows that have um, very deep, meaningful characters that go through um, growth. I love tears from my audience. I love laughter from my audience. I think that theater can be so therapeutic um, for the emotional response. On the other side, I also love just the most joyful, fluff, happy, happy. And that's why I really enjoy working with children's shows, um, middle school, high school, young adult shows that are just happy and not heavy. Um, and I like to, you know, to produce those as well. So I'm definitely um, interested in both sides of the spectrum. But let me share with you some of the, the actors that what they came up with, um, what show, shows that they're looking for and what roles they're seeking as well. Um, definitely looking for um, BIPOC and trans-led stories that aren't about them just living their trauma on the stage. Same for queer stories that aren't just based in tragedy. Um, shows that are just not, that the storyline is just about the tragic things that have happened to this individual or to this group or to, I mean, that is something that we find over and over again. Just lovely, happy stories about um, these, uh, what constitutes a small cast? Um, for me, a small cast is like two to four would be like small. I'm talking like small cast, very ensemble. Two to four is like what I love. I love where the actors are, they never leave the stage. It's all up to them. Um, some of my favorite shows that exist would be like Ordinary Days, Four People. Um, title of show, Four People. Um, tick, Tick, Boom, Three People. Um, last Five Years, those kind of, that's my personal, like I love it. Plaid Tidings, Four People, Piano, and a, I, I love that small, 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 intimate. Um, that, I mean, obviously it's, it's challenging for the actor they all, everybody's very much an ensemble because they're on stage the whole time. That's my definition of a small cast. Um, also same for people with disabilities. They wanna see stories of them experiencing joy, being celebrated, saving the day, being the superhero. Um, also, we had so many people who commented about shows, big, medium, small, all of them for mostly female casts um, that, we, we keep finding shows that are just predominantly male. It's already difficult at the regional and community le you know, level, and especially middle school and high school to be producing these shows that all the leads are male. When, you, they, when you've got a high school that's only got two, two young men who can sing, um, you know, it's difficult. And then also those voices aren't usually ready to sing these Broadway shows that are all these crazy high tenors. Um, Another thing that kept coming up is more variety in the vocal types. Um, we've gotten into such a rut, a rut with just traditional shows that the lead's a tenor and the, you know, the female lead is at high belt. Um, you know, why can't the lead be an alto? Why can't the lead be a baritone or a bass? Um, so varying vocal types. Another thing that kept coming up was talking about the age of the actors. Um, focusing on middle age, older actors, 40 to 60. What, what happens after the kids leave the nest? What, what's marriage look like? What does the, you know, the new changes of love and sex and everything for 40 to 50 to 60 year old actors where we've got these brilliant actors who are tired of just always being the grandma or the mom. Um, things that are not just always an adaptation of a beloved um, property. Somebody wrote more you're in town, less little women. And I love that, right? More brand new creative works um, and less just, you know, using the same well-known storylines. Um, another thing that came up was non-romance focused plots, um, especially for leading roles for women, but then also for shows that can be done at that young adult level where it's not just all fall in love, romance um, plots as well. And then another thing that came up um, was just in, in casting in general is that writers, you have so much um, ability to change how a show is cast by what you put in the cast needs and the character descriptions. Um, we would love to see more shows where 
all roles could be played by any age, any ethnicity, any gender. And then also if there are roles that that you would be okay with things being transposed, right? So if this, this role is just, you know, Stacy and Stacy could be male or female representing. And if it's an alto or a baritone, it doesn't matter. We'll change it to, to meet that person, those kind of things. Um, that would be really good. And then the last thing that came up from the actor's point of view is said, um, if, you know, in writing for other people that are different than you, if you're a non-queer person telling a queer story or you're a white person telling a BIPOC story, you better have done your homework and gotten some feedback and consultation. And this is my favorite, favorite sentence. We can always spot a story about us that was done without us. I'll repeat that again. We can always spot a story about us that was done without us. So when you are creating these characters and these roles that are living different lifestyles or living different experiences than you, consult other people in the writing of those characters. Um, so that's the actor's point of view. So hopefully that kind of got some things either confirmed for you or encouraging for you. Um, from the producer's point of view, this is from folks who are running theaters, um, who are theater directors at all levels. The thing that kept coming up over and over and over, I can't even tell you how many comments and then on the comments, there'd be 30 likes on these. Um, contemporary middle school and high school shows, shows that are appropriate, even if your intention is for them to be performed by adults, shows that could be done appropriately with younger ages, that are female driven, appropriate top topics that aren't just Disney stories or fairy tales. Um, high school appropriate musical with or with a, without romance. But if it's with romance, that's not overly sexualized. Again, from the producer's point of view, flexibility and inclusivity in the casting and the type. Um, and then this is another thing that so surprised me, but I had multiple people who brought it up from actors and producers. People are really interested in acapella musicals, which is kind of unique and interesting. Uh, kind of going with the whole show choir, pentatonics, barbershop. Um, on TikTok, if you're on TikTok, the whole sea shanty thing is really big right now. And people loved that. Um, and then from the audience point of view, this was from folks who like what they wanted to see as an audience member, had a lot of people who came up with um, fun escape upbeat shows. Um, after such a hard year, I love to see a Hello Dolly, things that are colorful, fun, and positive. And then another favorite sentence of mine was, don't pander to me, don't patronize me, and don't preach to me. Give me authenticity and truth. And I loved that sentence because that, that truly is so important as well, is that there's so many things about the human experience that as long as we're living in that authentic and truthful space, that it's absolutely um, important. So on this point of view, on this vision um, goals and wishes that I want to leave for you is really what do you want and need to write when you are pitching the show to me or anybody else that's what I care about from the writer's perspective is why did you write this show why did you need to write this show why did you need to tell this story um, why did you need to put this in with music that to me is so important as a part of the pitch not just to me, but to other people as well. And then I also think as you're building a community around these shows and building a following, I think that that is so important as well. Um, I think we all know those stories of famous songs or hymns or shows where we know the reason that that song was written. And I think that that's really important. But for us to know that, you have to have one. So um, just real quick before any more questions, and I know we're kind of running out of time. Um, that's, that's in a nutshell of what I'm looking at for these pitch nights. Um, I want to have a very succinct idea of what your show is, what you're wanting to accomplish with it, what, what it looks like to you in your head, but then also why you wrote it, why you wrote it, why you need it to write it. Um, and then logistically, piano vocal score, that's the bare minimum. Anything else than that is better. Um, for as far as writer involvement, communication is key, being available to answer questions, 
Um, and then being open to the feedback um, that this support that this can be and support your journey of writing your musicals. Um, for the pitch night, uh, when we get to that, if you've submitted for that, what I um, would love um, is for to hear maybe a song, whether it's a demo of your song, or if you yourself are a piano vocalist or a guitar vocalist to even sing a repeating theme for us, those kind of things would be amazing. Um, just anything that you can do to get us excited about the show. Um, and, you know, I think another great thing is figuring out a great way to get us excited about the show without telling us the punchline, right? Um, I think that's a really important way of, you know, and ending it with, and then there's a twist or, and there's something that happens, those kind of things. Okay. Good questions, Frank. Do you need demo tracks of each song? I don't for this. Um, as long as I have a fully realized piano vocal score, um, you know, I, I probably should charge admission, but I probably at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night, I'll perform the whole show for you in my living room, um, by myself. That's, that's what I do. I put two iPads up. I have a script on one and I have the score on the other and I just kind of go through it and I play it all. So no, um, I don't personally need demo tracks. Um, I do think though, that after our reading, that that is a nice thing. That's a nice next step is looking into demo tracks. Um, and then you'll have a whole cast of people who've already learned your music, who would love to, to sing those for you. Um, do you think producers poke around online before they see a show to see if they'll like it? So is an online presentation necessary? Um, that's a great question for Holly. That is her domain when it comes to online presence and marketing. Um, I know for myself, when I start to hear of a show, um, lately on Instagram, I've been following a couple of folks who've been writing some new musicals or I'll see a, a song from it. And yes, my next thing is to go see if there's a website for their show. Um, or I'll, you might, might search on YouTube and see if anyone's sung any of their songs on YouTube. So I think that an online presence is definitely, um, something that's going to get it widely produced.